Well, thanks, Eric. That's uh, going to be a difficult uh, introduction to live up to. And, uh, and needless to say, this is going to be a difficult meeting to uh, summarize. The life of the summarizer is always a precarious one. And uh, I encountered some special hazards at this meeting, uh, uh, particularly the sort of creeping intrusion of uh, really polished rhetoric at the podium. I mean, we really had some seriously good very carefully prepared talks. It's a challenge, of course, for a, 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 summarize, a summarizer to operate in that uh, environment. I was uh, asking Rick Lifton uh, whether he prepared his talk uh, just for us. And he said, oh, sure, actually. I just uh, put it together yesterday morning. This, uh, this reminded me of a, a joke that uh, it's kind of at the antipode of the Dan Quayle jokes, as far as uh, speakers go, involves one of the, the uh, famous speakers of the 20th century, Winston Churchill. The, as this story goes, uh, a parliament staff member was wandering through the back halls of the parliament building and went into a conference room, suddenly encountered uh, the great man himself, uh, by himself, making a vigorous point. And, uh, so he tried the impossible, which was to sort of back out uh, quickly without being noticed. But without breaking his uh, train of thought, Churchill said, uh, uh, I was quite all right. I was just uh, practicing my extemporaneities. <laughs> so I think uh, that's probably what Rick Lifton was doing yesterday morning. We had. Uh, you know, everything at this meeting from some really polished and uh, deeply thoughtful talks about the future of our endeavor uh, to other activities that were a little closer to a barroom brawl. And uh, I will uh, take a pass at trying to make some sense out of this, but uh, inevitably we'll, we'll do so uh, by uh, projecting some of my view of uh, where we've been, where we are, and uh, where we're going. I, really can't uh, avoid that. Uh, so we had a lot of talk about 20-year time scales and uh, some in interesting uh, ways of playing on that theme, uh, which I'll uh, uh, comment on. But I wanted to play my own 20-year uh, sort of game involving uh, looking back. This is a, a slide that I prepared 20 years ago. And uh, I want to use it to illustrate uh, a variety of points. I mean, first of all, we're, we're well aware of how the technology has changed and uh, the, the technology of slide making is, uh, is out on the lead. Uh, PowerPoint at least provides some leveling of the playing field between the summarizer and uh, the uh, other speakers. This is a PowerPointized version of, a, of a, a slide which I drew myself with a Leroy lettering set you know, using uh, India ink. And uh, I think uh, one of the points I'd like to, to make about it is uh, there's a principle of human nature that has been pointed out by a variety of, sort of futurists uh, that, uh, that humans tend to overestimate the amount of change that will occur on a relatively short time scale, uh, let's say on the order of five years, and underestimate the amount of change that will occur on a longer time scale, such as 20 years. And uh, this slide, I think, illustrates that point. Uh, uh, when, I draw, when I drew it, uh, I thought of the implementation of this plan as something that could certainly be accomplished in, let's say, two or three years in an organism such as yeast that I was working on and that the extension to, uh, to larger genomes would be relatively straightforward. Uh, it actually took much longer than that, and in, in fact, it was really only in about 1998 that, uh, that uh, Mark O'Mara and John McPherson and others uh, uh, actually successfully implemented schemes of this type on the scale of the mammalian genome. So it actually took nearly 20 years, uh, despite really the conspicuous simplicity of, the, of this basic plan of action. Uh, I think in thinking ahead, uh, this principle of uh, of 
uh, overestimating how different the world will be five years from now and underestimating how different it will be 20 years from now will loom over our prognostications. Because although I couldn't have imagined in 1981 uh, that it would take nearly 20 years actually to bring this simple scheme to full fruition, I also couldn't even come close to imagining uh, how much the world of genomics would have changed. Uh, so there was this yin-yang uh, aspect, if you had told me at that time that we would be looking at a complete uh, human genome sequence and uh, you know, detailed genetic maps and, uh, and a very rapidly growing uh, area that is central to biomedical research in 20 years, I couldn't have imagined that, uh, even though I would have thought we should have been able to build these contigs a little more quickly. So, in trying to think about uh, summarizing this meeting, I mean, there, there was so much discussed that it seemed clear to me that, uh, that I would have to uh, attack at a relatively high level of, of generalization. And I, I identified uh, two what I call uh, central tensions that I want to focus on. So I deliberately am using this term tensions. Uh, because I think they're not choices, they're not dichotomies. We're going to do some mixture of these various, uh, uh, we're, we're going to pursue some mixture of these various options. Uh, but I think that they will, uh, in many ways, uh, dominate the decisions that need to be made by all of us individually and by programs and so forth uh, over the next 20 years. So the two that uh, I chose are the following. The one. Uh, central tension is between what I call reference databases and uh, on-the-fly acquisition of genomic data. And I think uh, much of the discussion at this meeting really hinges on the question of when is it the right thing to do uh, to develop a relatively large, well-organized, centralized project uh, to create a reference database that many people will use over a very long period of time. And when is it the right thing to do to really uh, promote uh, highly modular, uh, extensible, distributable uh, technology, get it out in the hands of the smallest labs that, uh, that, that have the critical mass of expertise to deploy it and uh, encourage them to do so in the context of hypothesis-driven research uh, focused on very specific questions. And it's a tension, as I said, not a dichotomy. I'm sure we'll be doing both of these things. We've done both in the past, and we'll do a lot more of both in the future. But the one cautionary tale uh, or cautionary note that I would like to emphasize is, is uh, really uh, made at the bottom of this slide. And that is, I don't think we should be too quick uh, to adopt the reference genome model. Uh, that was at the core of our greatest success. The idea of sequencing uh, reference genomes of intensively studied organisms, despite the difficulty, despite the cost, and despite the initial large skepticism of the molecular biological community, was a uniquely good idea. And I would actually like to, to, to uh, impart some scientific content uh, to this claim and use it to contrast with many of the types of genomic activity that were discussed at this meeting. Really at the core of this, uh, the uniqueness of the reference genome idea you know, is the central dogma of molecular biology. And partly again to show my age, I've uh, taken a little image from the book that many of us, I suspect, uh, in this room uh, used when we first encountered this very powerful view of how molecules uh, uh, are organized, informational molecules are organized uh, within the cell, functionally organized. Now, of course, we've learned a lot since 1965 about the details of this process, and, uh, and there uh, is a whole cottage industry of philosophers of science uh, sort of challenging the extent to which uh, this view even uh, is a remotely adequate summary of uh, the way that cells really work, uh, but it actually is, is a pretty good summary and underlies uh, much of the way we think about these processes. And really the message that I got from Watson's book, which uh, is, is uh, about genomes, uh, that is central to our thinking about this uh, subject, 
is that there really are the one finite component of biology. It was always a silly notion promoted in some quarters that, uh, that, that they were the key to understanding all of biology. Uh, clearly there is a, a need for an immense variety of activity. Uh, I think all of it and then some uh, discussed at this meeting to surround genome sequences. But we still come back to the fact that biology is at its simplest in a germ cell uh, when there is a haploid genome there. And from that information, uh, cells and organisms must bootstrap themselves with a rather minimum of pre-existing machinery uh, compared to uh, the organism that they will build and uh, maintain. And uh, this finiteness allows the completeness problem uh, to be solved to a good approximation. Uh, and it gives a, a, a database which really is, in a sense, I would argue, the mother of all databases in biology uh, because of its universality and its uh, uh, permanent importance in analyzing diverse biological phenomena. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is obvious and much uh, illustrated by this meeting uh, that uh, biology gets more complex very rapidly once one moves beyond the germline sequence. And so I, we, we talked at this meeting about understanding uh, epigenetic uh, modification, uh, alternative splicing, uh, uh, developmental regulation, uh, uh, translational control. Uh, reversible covalent modifications of proteins and so forth. And uh, whereas it is to me as a sort of old uh, kind of genome guy, hardcore genome guy, uh, a little frightening to think about the thousand dollar genome and uh, extrapolating current uh, production of uh, sequence data out into the stratosphere, uh, at least that's a well-defined activity and bounded uh, by essentially an infinite number of orders of magnitude uh, compared to understanding the epigenetic state of every genome in every cell at every stage of development and so forth for RNA molecules, for proteins and so forth. Uh, so I think the, the completeness problem is, uh, is huge and, uh, and the importance of its hugeness uh, is that it will create constant and I think uh, critical tension uh, between the question of when should we go out and measure uh, certain reference databases with the expectation that it will be worth the cost to acquire them, it'll be worth the financial cost, it'll be worth the cost in uh, centralizing uh, activities uh, in producing a database that will really be of sufficiently permanent uh, value to a sufficiently diverse user community for sufficiently diverse purposes uh, to really be meaningful. And when uh, should we be doing really science conceptually as usual, uh, but doing it with new tools uh, that allow people to ask fairly specific questions and to look at epigenetic modifications and alternative splicing and so forth in their particular uh, cell type as their particular as their particular process plays out while they're asking their particular questions and tuning the technology of that moment uh, to answering them as best they can. So that's uh, one tension. In some ways, a uh, a larger struggle uh, is, is underway and to me was a, a clear uh, tension in this meeting and will be a major tension uh, for the future. And it really is, I think, between essentially two ways of formulating uh, the future of, uh, of, of human genomics uh, and uh, related activities. So. There, there are these two ways of formulating the future. We heard both of them in many variations many times at this meeting. We have the human genome sequence and now we should concentrate on delivering the promised health benefits uh, versus we have the human genome sequence, something that we agree upon even though it's not uh, true actually. <laughs> and, uh, now we should concentrate on understanding how it works. Uh, so. The points were made, uh, I think, uh, in, in synthesis uh, very articulately and from many points of view uh, that this is a tension. Uh, it's not easily resolved. 
uh, people in this room are not in agreement about the relative proportion of activity that should go in these two different areas. The areas are actually different. Uh, they reflect rather different views of uh, what uh, scientists would like to accomplish with their own careers, what they would like to see happen uh, to our, uh, ac our collective acquisition and application of knowledge. And so we're going to need to work uh, on a uh, constructive, uh, creative uh, way of managing this tension. I'm going to focus largely on the first point, uh, mostly because I believe it was by far the most novel feature of this meeting compared to many previous ones that I've been at. Uh, you know, it was an interesting uh, example last night. I was at this dinner from hell uh, listening largely to uh, discussions about how to to make the mystery breakout groups as effective as possible. And uh, w when we got to discussing uh, one, which I ultimately uh, went, went to, uh, sort of on therapeutics, uh, there was an interesting little discussion amongst the various parties there about how, gee, we don't have the right people here to talk about that. This point was absolutely right. Uh, the number of people in the audience here who know anything about therapeutics is uh, small. And, uh, and most of the traditional uh, participants in the Genome Project, like me, uh, know almost nothing about therapeutics and therefore convey very little such information to our students, to the environments that we work in, uh, and so forth. Uh, so that my, I did make the one point at this, uh, me at this meeting that uh, this is actually quite an interesting situation that uh, under these historical circumstances, which Francis, I think, very nicely articulated the first night, we really are at a major point of departure in this endeavor. Uh, this planning exercise is unlike all previous planning exercises uh, because we are looking at a much blanker slate as to where are we going to go as a community. Uh, and we now find that in the year 2001, when we assemble much of the elite of the genome world and a very interesting uh, collection of other people that, that can contribute to this uh, discussion, uh, that uh, there are very few people there that know much about the development of therapeutics, that is about the details of how one, or even the generalities of how one gets from a genome sequence to health benefits. So I think this actually is a profound point and, uh, and one that we need to change, regardless of the way that this tension that I am focusing on plays out, it needs to change. Uh, we need to teach our graduate students, we need to inject it into our training programs, into genome meetings. You, know, you go to a Cold Spring Harbor genome meeting and there's not even a poster, much less a talk or a session about how to get from genomics to therapeutics. Uh, Journals like Genomics and Genome Research really just don't publish this type of work. That's going to change, and uh, we've got to make that change because, of course, all of these processes are really us. Uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit, despite my uh, very tenuous knowledge of this subject, uh, on how it is that this side of this tension uh, might be imagined to play out and what some of the issues are that I heard discussed uh, at this meeting that need to be taken into account. So I was uh, quite taken by my colleague, uh, Bonnie Pagan. I think like most of you, I get to know some of my colleagues uh, mostly on the overnight flights to Dulles and uh, <laughs> shuttle buses to Early House and so forth. Uh, but she, uh, who uh, for those of you who don't know her, is a uh, very experienced clinical geneticist who has uh, spent her career taking care of uh, largely kids uh, with a variety of genetic defects and uh, has more recently been heavily involved in, uh, in uh, trying to improve the accessibility of uh, genetic information to the practitioners who need it. Uh, but I was taken by her metaphor, uh, which was the metaphor of the narrow squeezed pipeline. And uh, it seemed to me to encapsulate a lot of discussion I heard at this meeting. And I want with some care uh, to look at this dynamic because I believe some of the issues uh, that are uh, symbolized on this slide are very important uh, to us. Uh, 
so uh, the basic metaphor, as I understood it, is that we have over here uh, genomic data, techniques, conceptual paradigms, that is the kind of hard science of genomics, which is really where the successes have been uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. And we have over there what is really largely a dream of better health through novel therapies, prevention, and personalized medicine. And uh, not only is the pipeline uh, narrow that uh, connects these two, uh, we have some successes, but the very frequency uh, with which they're mentioned is an indication that, uh, that the amount of flow through this pipeline is as yet uh, small. And there's no question that the pipeline has been under very close scrutiny because of real or perceived ethical, legal, and social risks. And certainly, in addition to the theme of this meeting that suddenly we have people like me now in discussions about drug development, uh, the permeation of this uh, meeting with, with uh, much broadened vision of the ELSI uh, issues uh, was also, I think, new and striking. It struck me and a number of other people have commented on that. Uh, and so all of that is, in a sense, here on this slide. Uh, so I want to say just a little more about it. So we, I think, are coming to a pretty clear consensus uh, that a major NHGRI mission of the future could be formulated somewhat in the following way. It's to develop broadly applicable paths from the genome sequence to better health that are consistent with our society's ethical, legal, and social values. So mission statements of this type are easy to state and ex exceedingly difficult. Uh, not just to uh, carry out, but uh, it's uh, difficult even uh, to design a sensible path forward uh, that will move in the direction of this large a uh, mandate. Uh, so I'm going to look at this uh, a little bit programmatically and a little bit scientifically. Let me first take up uh, what I regard to be some essentially programmatic issues. So these are just examples. There are a lot of other examples, but uh, three that stood out uh, for me at this meeting are, are the ones on this slide of implications uh, for taking up seriously uh, this challenge of delivering on the health promises of the genome. And uh, I've already said that uh, a striking feature of this meeting was uh, an expansion and changing of the dynamic of the uh, discussion uh, between the ELSI program and the, the larger uh, uh, enterprises of the NHGRI. I think it's clear that we must define a role for the ELSI program that is uh, much broader than its current one and more integral uh, to the overall NHGRI mission. I think it is becoming increasingly clear to many people involved in this endeavor from many different points of view uh, that it needs to become literally more integral. It needs to become integrated in many ways into our thinking uh, about resource allocation, about the way the science is actually carried out, and I believe in a subtle way, uh, but potentially very powerful one, uh, a greater awareness of these questions will gradually influence the kind of science that we all do. And uh, that will be the ultimate impact of a broadened ELSI program is really a different kind of scientific program. And I don't mean one that's more tightly regulated and which has more uh, attention to this, that, or the other constraint on the research, but it involves a bigger, uh, bigger thoughts about how the science integrates into the society uh, in which the science is carried out. And I'm going to come back, I'll just anticipate uh, at the end of this talk, uh, really to uh, one of the big themes that I've gotten out of this phase of the Genome Project, and that is the intensely social nature of this endeavor that we're involved in. So that's one set of issues. Uh, the second point, uh, to some degree, applies regardless of where we are on this uh, this. Uh, how, how it is that we're managing this tension between uh, uh, trying to understand biology and trying to improve human health. 
uh, in dealing with the, the, uh, the dichotomy, the overlap, and all of the aspects of that tension. Uh, but I put it here because I do think that it has a broader dimension in the context of the, of, of the desire uh, to uh, focus more of our attention on this translation of the genome sequence into better health. So I think it's, it's conspicuous that we must devote an increasing fraction of resources. And, and the issue really is the fraction of resources, because if we have more resources to collect data with, uh, there is going to be an increasing need uh, for the uh, attention to the ways in which we make the data accessible and analyzable and so forth. So we must uh, devote an increasing fraction of resources to facilitating access and uh, analysis, access to and analysis of existing data as opposed to the acquisition of new data. We're going to be collecting a lot of new data, and if we get the $1,000 genome, uh, we're going to actually start to do something that people erroneously thought we were doing 20 years ago, which was stressing the, uh, you know, hardware uh, capabilities of, uh, that Moore's Law was providing us with. Uh, but uh, so I'm not uh, arguing that we're making some conversion to theoretical biology here, but an increasing fraction of resources must go into this area and, and much, must do so in a much broader way than we've really thought about before. Uh, I think actually a lot of progress has been made in this area. Uh, you know, we, scientists love to complain uh, about things, and uh, yes, the genome sequence is difficult to use. Uh, yes, it's not very well annotated. Uh, some of the difficulties are is because it's not done, and it'll get easier to annotate and easier to use when it is done. Uh, but others of the difficulties are just inherent. It's a hard problem. But for example, I, uh, I would encourage uh, uh, people who haven't used Map Viewer uh, at the NCBI, let's say in the last month or two, uh, to do so. It has been a product that has been improving dramatically month by month. And, uh, and I think that's just one example, and that's at the sort of narrow base of this problem. Uh, we need uh, annotation, 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 integration, 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 and so forth. We've been hearing that over and over again, and I think it's absolutely true. And to the extent that, uh, that uh, we take seriously this health mission, and I think we will be taking seriously this health mission, uh, it adds, of course, a whole additional set of layers of, of, uh, of need for access to phenotypic information and uh, ultimately clinical information and so forth. This is a big uh, challenge and uh, has many dimensions, but is going to be uh, a big part of our future. And finally, just uh, following up on my comment that uh, we're, we're uh, envisioning this uh, sort of large-scale uh, somewhat true believer effort to uh, improve human health through uh, genomics, kind of better livings through uh, gene sequencing. Uh, we, uh, we need a lot of education, not too much, uh, because uh, the strength actually of genomics from its earliest days uh, is that uh, people who didn't really know what they were doing uh, had uh, a sort of a basic view that they could change the way that things are done. And it's always people who don't know what they're doing that are the best change agents. Uh, you know, Delbrook didn't know a damned thing about viruses, but uh, it's fortunate that we didn't sort of turn that project over to the virologists of the day. So uh, we will be intensely criticized uh, as a community, uh, certainly to the extent that people like I are, am involved in it. We will be intensely criticized uh, for moving on to all sorts of other people's turf. Uh, fortunately, uh, those of us who have been through a lot of these planning processes and those ancillary activities are uh, immune to such criticism. And, I've uh, altogether lost track of the number of things that I've been criticized for that uh, were of this same general nature. Uh, but uh, we succeeded at sequencing the human genome because uh, as a community we learned what we needed to learn. Uh, 
We may not have done uh, everything in the most elegant way, and some of our fluorescent dyes, you know, maybe didn't have quite the quantum yield that the uh, the uh, best uh, photophysicists could have provided, but they did get the job done. And as a community, we learned what we needed to learn, and uh, we can do that here too. And uh, and we have to do that, and it has to be a really major activity. This uh, this problem that I uh, stated that uh, our major journals, our major meetings, our training grants uh, really don't uh, engage this issue has got to change. And it's not going to change tomorrow, but it's going to change by uh, uh, an intense sort of cultural process. I think a lot of us are personally committed to this and will be ultimately the most important, that will ultimately be the most important uh, factor for change, but there are of course things that can be done way of workshops, short courses, and, uh, and so forth. So I want to get back to this, uh, this mission, which is kind of central to my synthesis of, of this meeting, and uh, now take a, a look at it from a more scientific perspective. And uh, I'm going to do that uh, using a slide that we've seen, I think, at least twice uh, before. Uh, I, one of the virtues of PowerPoint uh, I really didn't prepare this talk in advance, uh, but I have on my little disc here every slide that I've ever shown in the last uh, 20 years, 10 years. Uh, the, uh, a lot of my earlier ones were PowerPointized, as you've seen. Uh, I think this is actually the original version of this uh, figure. The two that we uh, saw were uh, updated versions. Uh, but the idea is clear. The updating is mostly about the top of this uh, sort of modernizing the scientific context in which we arrive at a gene that, um, that we already have knowledge because of the way that we got there uh, about genetic knowledge about, uh, but often very little other knowledge. And uh, so in this, uh, this uh, Shattuck lecture, which I would commend uh, uh, to you because it's really exactly on this topic of uh, how to translate knowledge of the genome sequence into uh, uh, health benefits. And these are three branches uh, of uh, translation were uh, articulated. I just want to touch very briefly on some of the things that I heard at this meeting about each of these branches, and then I'm going to take the liberty of providing a modest critique of the right-hand branch, uh, which is where I believe most of our bets ultimately lie. So we uh, have a lot of diagnostics, and we had a lot of talk at this meeting about, uh, about the, both the potential benefits, a few examples of real benefits, uh, and uh, various LC issues which are, are real and have been studied rather intensively about uh, attempting to carry out this uh, branch. Uh, we had the sobering reminder, which uh, comes up every time these issues are discussed and should come up every time these issues are discussed, that, uh, that uh, history isn't terribly encouraging about this uh, preventive medicine, uh, particularly when it involves any change in people's lifestyles. And the tobacco example is the, sort of the mother of all such uh, examples. And, uh, and there's no question that pharmacogenomics is going to, is going to play a role. Uh, I think the issue is whether it's going to be a rather niche role, uh, somewhat like uh, other uh, well-defined genetic diseases. There are certainly people out there, we can even recognize some of them now, uh, who are at high risk of adverse reactions, uh, sometimes uh, catastrophic adverse reactions to particular drugs. Uh, because of Mendelian genetic conditions or near Mendelian ones. Uh, I think that's not the issue. The issue is, is this really going to be a path broadly uh, towards better health care for most people uh, to personalize the medicine? And I think that uh, Rick uh, a bit uh, finessed this issue, but uh, I think uh, in the year 2020, I'm, I'm still uh, trying to make up my mind about uh, the impact of diagnostics and preventive medicine and on uh, mainstream medicine. And, uh, and the gene therapy issues were, uh, were discussed in a somewhat similar vein. I think the only uh, 
a summary I would make of several discussions I heard about uh, gene therapy is that even amongst some of the people here who are very knowledgeable about this subject and involved in it, I heard uh, no strong claim or I any claim uh, that, uh, that, the, that the field is seriously under-supported at the moment and that existing mechanisms of funding uh, progress in this area are inadequate. And uh, from that, I infer that if, if gene therapy is to play a substantial uh, component of this translation of the genome sequence into better health, that, uh, that the NHGRI's role will, will be at the at really the more novel idea end of, of this, that is uh, very basic research, uh, because the message I got is that uh, the translational research on the diseases that uh, are under serious study now uh, is progressing and is probably adequately supported. Uh, and then on the, on the right-hand branch, we have where I think most of our bets are placed. Uh, and uh, this was discussed, uh, but I want to provide a slightly contrarian view of the level of challenge in carrying out uh, this agenda and to make a very simple but uh, I think important point in thinking about the challenge uh, ahead. And I'll do it by contrasting, and this really is a, you know, a freshman genetics uh, uh, point, but one that I think frequently gets lost in these discussions. I'm going to do it by contrasting the middle branch with the right-hand branch. The middle branch has the immense virtue of actually being a logical pathway. That is, you identify in the classic medical tradition uh, what's broken uh, at the beginning of the causal change of disease process and you fix it. Uh, so when we find this gene and know what bad effect it has on the patient, uh, then we, in principle, have a strategy for fixing that defect and uh, uh, providing effective therapy. The right-hand branch uh, typically uh, is an illogical path and struggles against its fundamental illogic. That is, we find what's broken uh, and then uh, hope essentially to fix it uh, by breaking something else. The overwhelming majority of drugs are antagonists rather than agonists. Uh, and so they, in general, and uh, all of you know that I'm uh, oversimplifying a situation that uh, continues on into graduate level genetics, but nonetheless, uh, the typical mutation uh, leads to uh, deficiency or absence of protein function, and the typical drug uh, has the same effect. Uh, and uh, when I have give, given talks to very general uh, audiences on this subject, I've used the example of BRCA1, and this uh, I've just found to be an effective teaching device, is that the immediate pharmacological message from identifying uh, BRCA1 as the gene mutated uh, in this high pre predisposition form of uh, breast cancer uh, is that the pharmaceutical industry would know how to develop novel carcinogens. It tells us nothing about how to develop anti-cancer agents. Now, in slides on meetings of this type, uh, we have uh, optimistic talk about bootstrapping around uh, pathways and uh, using the mechanistic insights that come uh, from recognizing these mutations and their phenotypic effects uh, to find drug targets lurking somehow nearby. And uh, some examples, as I've reviewed this literature, mostly rather tenuous ones, uh, show how this might work out. I think the the point I'm trying to make here is that we, we don't have a general approach here. Uh, we have uh, a belief that uh, understanding a lot of mechanistic issues in pathophysiology is an essential step in providing good treatment, uh, but we certainly don't have a general way of moving down this pathway, uh, and we're never likely to. Uh, 
uh, because of the fundamental logic of the situation. And the fact that this biochemical study that is the critical intermediary uh, is going to be inherently idiosyncratic in every particular case, uh, depending on the particular nature of the defect. So I injected this scientific point uh, really uh, not to sound a note of pessimism, uh, but to emphasize that we are taking on here an immense challenge. It's a, a challenge that has immense social components. It also has immense uh, scientific components. And I'm going also to return uh, shortly to the question that uh, one of the reasons that we need more of this public education that was much discussed at this meeting uh, is to undo uh, some fairly serious damage uh, that has been done uh, from many uh, sides in uh, exaggerating the extent to which uh, there is a simple path down this diagram to improved therapy. This is the sort of uh, gene today, gone tomorrow theme, uh, which I have seen used in settings uh, that are poignant. That is, uh, disease uh, interest groups uh, focused on uh, what by current science are absolutely intractable uh, developmental genetic defects uh, in which using the tools that we know so much about how to deploy, uh, we've gotten started on this diagram. Uh, that is, we have the gene today, uh, but these diseases are not going to be gone tomorrow, and some of these diseases are never going to be gone. And this is a message that I have not heard made even one time in a, in a uh, public uh, environment in which uh, the broad subject is discussed every day. Uh, so there are challenges ahead. Uh, I want to, uh, to move now to uh, a somewhat facetious look uh, at an aspect of Rick uh, Lifton's uh, uh, time travel. So this exercise uh, revealed something that was uh, actually deeply uh, personally uh, rewarding to me, is that uh, I discovered that, uh, that those of us scientifically active in 2001 are, are truly members of the greatest generation of genome researchers. The reason I had this rare insight uh, is that I found that uh, in 2020, uh, every uh, health advance uh, owed to genomics was firmly rooted in research agendas which are already clearly formulated, underway, and just need uh, good execution. Uh, so we can feel really good about having gotten this very hard problem uh, almost exactly right. But we should also, of course, feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, these reports from the future uh, may not be entirely infallible. And the way I would sort of frame that question is, is in this way. Uh, do we risk adopting policies now uh, that sell the generation that say that we'll be hitting its stride in 2010 short? And what I mean by this uh, is that given a proper chance, uh, they are likely to, to devise broadly applicable pathways from the genome sequence to improved health that differ substantially from those that we presently envision. And this is partly a, a speculation which has uh, overwhelming historical support, uh, given uh, the, the difficulty of prognosticating, uh, particularly prognosticating the future. It, uh, but uh, it also has policy implications, which I really think we need to take seriously. Uh, so uh, let me amplify slightly on this point. The, uh, the worry that I have uh, is that we have so much confidence uh, now, after two decades of success, uh, that we know how to carry out this mission, uh, that we are going to lock up uh, resources, ways of doing the science, ways of thinking about the science uh, in expensive, very long-term uh, commitments uh, which will preclude the type of innovation that I think that we're going to need 
And I'm not actually talking here about the serendipitous scientific discovery, uh, which is really a more relevant issue on the biology side of this tension, which is not where I'm focusing. Uh, I'm really talking here not about new discoveries, uh, but just about new ways of approaching the problem, uh, ways of, uh, of adding uh, new branches uh, to Francis's uh, diagram. And what I mean by a broadly applicable pathway uh, is illustrated uh, somewhat, all analogies are treacherous, but it is illustrated somewhat uh, by the positional cloning phenomenon. I would describe positional cloning as having been a new broadly applicable pathway uh, from genetic observation to an understanding of molecular defects in genetic disease. Uh, there were actually no really new ideas uh, behind uh, positional cloning. Uh, by the time that uh, it was being seriously promoted in about 1980, uh, it was rooted in, in aspects of human genetics and recombinant DNA technology that were by that time well understood. Uh, and uh, the feasibility actually was in no serious doubt. Uh, but there was a large job uh, to formulate the potential advantages of this strategy, uh, of course, to work through a large number of implementation details, uh, to educate a whole community that wasn't accustomed to thinking in this way. But all of these things did happen, and in a course of really just, say, 10 or 15 years, uh, certainly the medical genetics textbooks were rewritten uh, from beginning to end. Uh, and rewritten in a way that a biochemist uh, could understand, and that's, as we've seen, a, an essential step toward, uh, toward better treatments, although not an infallible one. But my point is to illustrate what I mean by a broadly applicable pathway. And the question uh, that I'd like to focus on just very briefly at the risk of indulging uh, just one of my own personal interests uh, is to try to illustrate uh, what I mean by this. And my argument here is not that the particular idea that I'm going to propose uh, is, a, is, is a certain winner or even a likely winner, uh, but it is to illustrate with a scientific example uh, the way I think about this problem. And it does also connect to a substantial amount of discussion that occurred at this meeting about the, the uh, relative uh, priority that should be given to primate sequencing and how we would work with that information. So these uh, are our closest uh, relatives, and uh, it's easy to, uh, to pick the human out here without being a primatologist. Uh, he's actually the photographer, and of course there's a major message in the fact that he's taking pictures of them instead of them taking pictures of him. Uh, that is, there are major uh, sort of cultural and behavioral differences between these uh, different closely related uh, primates. Uh, but there is a more fundamental point, and that is that it isn't just anthropocentrism uh, to look at this picture or to walk around a primate house in a zoo and to recognize that humans are the uh, novel offshoot of a generally fairly conservative evolutionary lineage. One of the great problems in evolutionary biology, of course, is to understand how such lineages uh, arise. Generally stable uh, evolutionary lineages rarely, but occasionally, uh, launch altogether new experiments in a way that no one could have predicted uh, five million years ago, uh, even if, uh, if uh, Benefit, even with the benefit in another time travel sense of sort of modern cognitive capabilities and, uh, and even education, uh, say in uh, logical thinking and the empirical method, could have predicted how this was all going to play out. But it play out it did, and we have now the conspicuous outlier in the primate world, and it is us. So I want to, uh, to connect uh, what I readily acknowledge is simply personal interest uh, in this to, to my broader theme uh, by illustrating uh, how this way of looking at the comparative genomic problem with our closest relatives uh, uh, might represent a broadly applicable pathway uh, 
uh, which we are not pursuing in any significant way now uh, toward connecting genomes and to better human health. So it's based on a, a speculative evolutionary model uh, for the evolution of novelty and one that uh, potentially is applicable to many such uh, situations and is, uh, has a number of textbook features to it, but also, I think, some new ideas. Uh, we start with abrupt environmental change leading to greatly reduced competition in a rich habitat. This tends to be a characteristic as near as one can tell from most situations in which rapid evolution occurs, the simplest example being the Galapagos type one in which uh, what uh, previously non-existent terrestrial habitat in a fairly favorable climate and with a reasonable soil chemistry uh, pops up in the ocean and uh, there is uh, greatly relaxed competition for the first uh, migrants to arrive and uh, rapid evolution uh, ensues uh, with uh, considerable novelty given the time scale uh, and the small populations uh, in otherwise stable uh, lineages. Uh, so in more realistic situations, let's say such as uh, the savanna rainforest uh, boundary, uh, clearly there do need to be actual molecular novelties and uh, they, that allow one species to exploit uh, this new uh, habitat. But what's uh, different than many uh, views of this problem in this model, this speculative model, is the idea that uh, following this genetic opportunity to exploit a rich new habitat uh, that there is a cascade of loss of function mutations that compensate for the intrinsically poor adaptation of the species to the habitat. I mean, we know as geneticists know that this is what happens most readily uh, when you put uh, yeast cells on a plate at, let's say, a pH that yeast can barely tolerate is that you don't suddenly evolve uh, new proton pumps. Uh, you actually break ones that you've already got. Uh, and. Uh, it seems a reasonable conjecture and not a new one. H.J. Uh, Muller actually said that humans are hastily made over apes. That's the essential idea uh, behind this model. Uh, and I'll skip the point about extinction. The point medically is that it may well be that we need to understand this process. What were these compromises? And see, this is an altogether different focus than the question of why can we compose music and so forth and what were those uh, few uh, mutations that somehow enabled language. Actually focusing on the downside of being relatively early members of a novel evolutionary lineage uh, evolving in a constantly changing uh, environment to the, to the end point that's uh, illustrated on this uh, humorous cover and of course uh, symbolizes uh, the, uh, the core of the medical problem in, uh, in so-called advanced uh, countries. And so it may be that to some degree our obsessive focus with genotype phenotype variations within the human population uh, is uh, overdrawn uh, relative to trying to understand the broader spectrum of health vulnerabilities that are an intrinsic feature of this uh, aspect of the human evolutionary context. So I just hope uh, that you'll keep now clearly in mind my purpose here, uh, which is to illustrate that we don't necessarily just want to keep doing more efficiently, better organized, DUIC style management uh, to uh, do what we already have clearly in mind. And we particularly must be cautious uh, in not locking up all of our resources uh, in, these, uh, in these lines of activity which we now, now have in mind. Now it uh, reminds me of the current debate about the B-2 bomber which uh, basically all components of the military industrial uh, complex want to build a lot of uh, B-2 bombers. Uh, except actually the Air Force doesn't want them. And the Air Force doesn't want them uh, because uh, at a time when the uh, demands on the Air Force to be able to provide air power in highly flexible, uh, tactically responsive ways are ever increasing, uh, 
the Air, Air Force High Command understands that uh, a commitment to building uh, 50 new B-2 bombers uh, will preclude uh, a lot of more innovative activities in their somewhat distressing uh, mission. Uh, we should take some caution uh, about that same principle. So to really summarize my summary, uh, it, it is that I think we're all coming to more of an appreciation than perhaps uh, many of us had before uh, that, that the Human Genome Project was a social event. Uh, science is an intensely social activity. It was a social event at every level, uh, the social interactions in this kind of group, in this community, and of course the relationship to the larger society. I can't uh, resist uh, joking uh, about, uh, about this in that uh, typically the social events I go to at most, I uh, suffer one hangover. And uh, this uh, party, I, uh, which is now coming uh, near, near to a close, I can't count the number of hangovers that I've uh, <laughs> contributed to, uh, to this, uh, this really uh, heroic effort that I think uh, the, all the participants uh, in should, uh, should take pride in, uh, but should also reflect uh, rather deeply about where we uh, go from here. So I will close uh, with one last slide in which I cast my vote on uh, a, a topic that uh, we were charged to think about, but I actually heard no discussion about uh, during the meeting, and that has to do with whether or not we should retire our jersey. And, uh, my vote is that uh, we should, let me skip uh, this slide, that uh, I think at the appropriate moment, let's say that the Human Genome Project is over. And one of its legacies was the founding of an exciting, eclectic, and powerful new field of science. And the final charge I would just make uh, with my emphasis on enabling our successors is that uh, we should put a lot of our energy uh, into inspiring a new generation of scientists, uh, mostly younger than the people in this room, uh, because they're the people that are going to have to make this claim real. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions. Ewan. I, I, Speaking of I, young guys, yeah, right. I, I have to, I have to ask a question. I, I very much like your talk. One of the things that I always find confusing is, is that people never seem to say, "Well, let's just do the simple stuff well." So we have a lot of incredible information, and a lot of what we got to do is do the simple stuff very, very well about delivering it to a whole bunch of people who can use it very, very simply. They stop doing degenerate PCR. They stop doing southerns. They stop, they stop having to worry about how they collect their markers. They stop having to worry about how they collect their SNPs. And I just find it confusing that we, we miss out that why don't we do the simple stuff very, very well. I mean, that, that should be somehow an emphasis somewhere. No, I, pre I appreciate your comment. And you know, I think people who have seen me in this role before uh, know that I've sort of made my living by uh, arguing that we should do the simple stuff well. Um, I think that uh, to, to some degree that was an implication that I intended by my sort of short-term, long-term issue. Is that in the next five years, the world's going to change less than uh, I think many of these predictions, all uh, dis despite uh, my uh, admiration for, uh, for my former graduate students' uh, uh, technological uh, research. I'm skeptical that we'll even achieve one Burke in five years. <laughs> Uh, but I am not about to predict uh, how many Burks we're going to achieve uh, in, in 50 years and, and, uh, or 20 years. And the implication, uh, the, the way I would connect this to your question is just that uh, the world, I think, won't change as much as many people think in the next five years. And that's always an argument for doing the simple things well, uh, the things that can be done on that time scale and which have a, a relatively predictable payoff. Maynard, do, you, Maynard do, do you really think that we can use the genome for developing therapeutics without finding out how it works? Uh, yes. Well, that's what I wasn't certain you really thought that, but I wanted you to confirm it. Uh, 
Yes, I do think that. Um, the problem of trying to understand all of biology is, uh, is, a, is a wonderful problem and trying to understand how the genome works. And uh, it is, I tried to emphasize, an aspect of this uh, tension. Uh, but I, I, I think that if you look at the whole history of developing therapies, and let's, let's even limit our attention to the relatively knowledge-based therapies as opposed to the ones that were just ac altogether accidentally discovered, uh, almost always uh, they were discovered with very limited information. And, uh, there's still a lot of highly effective drugs uh, that we know very little, actually, about the detailed mechanism of action. And we certainly know nowhere near enough about all of the things they interact with to make any kind of predictive judgment that uh, this drug would have the effect it does. Uh, but nonetheless, it's an area in which a little bit of knowledge often goes a long ways. Rick. Rick. Yeah, that was really a beautiful synthesis of uh, a lot of complicated stuff. And one of the points that you made that I, I would like to emphasize and come back to is the notion that understanding pathophysiology doesn't immediately translate into therapy. And obviously we have examples that go back to the 1950s, uh, such as sickle cell anemia, where uh, we've known in great detail without being able to impact meaningfully uh, on the disease, uh, at least to date. Uh, However, I, I would submit that uh, we are at a time when now that we have genome sequence, we really have the opportunity to do the first part, which is to, con is to figure out the basic pathophysiology of disease. And that's the part that I'm most enthusiastic about because I do see a path to be able to do that. I'm quite agnostic about how that's going to be translated into therapy because I'm not smart enough to know that. But I think we now do begin to have the tools to really try to systematically figure out the pathogenesis of common diseases. And, and that, to me, is the uh, a galvanizing aspect of what NHGRI ought to be able to uh, focus on and motivate for the next 20 years. Right. Well, I, uh, I, I basically do agree with that uh, and didn't mean to imply otherwise. Uh, uh, Rick Lifton, who was uh, once one of my star freshman chemistry students, uh, <laughs> characterized himself uh, the other day as, uh, as someone who, despite his, uh, his charming 20-year uh, look into the future, as someone who mostly thinks about what to do uh, that afternoon, and his track record indicates that he, does, he thinks about it very clearly and uh, very well. And uh, th there are, th this is something we can do and we should do, and uh, it's fantastic. I mean, what's been learned is fantastic. You take, you take the, you know, the, the, the genetic diseases, particularly the ones that are fairly intensively studied, uh, where, where we've kind of had the gene for a decade or so, and uh, it's astonishing uh, the amount of pathophysiological information that we've learned. And uh, my, I think my only point, it's, it's an issue of which way to lean in the boat, and uh, my only point is that I, I, I wouldn't want to see the NHGRI's mission defined as understanding uh, pathophysiology. Uh, when understanding pathophysiology is the most effective path uh, toward improved health, then uh, we should do it. Uh, but we shouldn't regard it as, its, as, as our central mission. I also would like to thank you because it was a wonderful talk. I did have, however, some small concern about the slide concerning the uh, pipeline. And the LC as the pipeline seemed to be presented almost like the rate limiting factor in taking basic science and translating it into health interventions. I don't know if that's how it was intended, but it could give that impression. And, and of course, it's, it's not possible, I don't think, to think of LC as the rate limiting factor because whether or not there's an actual demand, a need for such kinds of services, uh, whether or not there's any incentive on the part of anybody to take basic science and translate it into those services, are equally important. And indeed, on some occasions, LC scrutiny, which sure can slow things down in a kind of pipeline narrowing way in some cases, might speed it up by alleviating certain problems that might otherwise arise in that pipeline. So the slide, I know you didn't intend it to be one that created a kind of adversarial relationship between LC and basic science or LC and, and uh, technology development, but um, I think it could give that impression. I think it would be a misimpression. Uh, it is certainly a misimpression, but I appreci appreciate your comment because I, I think it actually was one of the most interesting aspects of this meeting. Uh, both Bonnie Pagan and Rick Lifton, for example, told me that they uh, had uh, 
quite a number of comments about their talks uh, yesterday from people involved in LC activities uh, along these lines that sta statements they made were perceived uh, as having put uh, you know, uh, unfair amount of responsibility on the LC process as, uh, as inhibiting uh, progress. Uh, what I think was very constructive about this meeting is that uh, I believe this type of dialogue was engaged at a level of uh, candor and realism that I haven't heard before. Uh, it is absolutely a misimpression about this uh, slide. The reason for my rather careful attention uh, to my view of the scientific challenge, the reason why the scientific challenge is severe, uh, is to indicate that I believe that pipeline is narrow because we don't really know how to do this scientifically. I absolutely do not believe uh, that uh, we are right on the path uh, toward uh, tremendous health benefits if we could just get the paperwork out of the way. In fact, the, the, the slide that I skipped uh, actually was an advertisement from uh, Agilent, as it happens. Uh, it shows a sort of uh, colorful double helix uh, here. And uh, the uh, attention-getting claim that at the top of this ladder is a world without disease and that we're uh, going to get to that ladder essentially by uh, better execution technically of the types of uh, laboratory activities that were the dominant uh, theme of this meeting. Uh, I'd like to have more scientists out there with me on the lecture uh, circuit uh, saying that it is morally wrong uh, for companies to run advertisements of this type. Keith Crandall from Brigham Young. I, I agree with that, and, and I want to stay on this theme of that slide, your dumbbell slide with the, with the narrow line in between. And I want to ask the, the question, um, we're, we're not even, we don't even have this letter yet. It's expected April 2003, right? Um, and, and presumably there must be some expectation of a, of a time lag from having that basic information to going to useful therapeutics. What, in your mind, is a, is a reasonable time frame for that? I mean, to me, it's, it's unrealistic to expect that before we even have the basic data. And how, how long do we expect, what's that time frame for that expectation to become realized? Well, so the way to answer that, I, just uh, referring back to something I said earlier, is that the, the first thing I'd just like to say on that, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the talk about the diagnostic therapeutic gap, and I heard a fair amount of talk about it at this meeting. Uh, that's a sort of common phrase. Uh, this gap is going to extend forever in the case of uh, a number of catastrophic human conditions. Uh, that's the reality. We, it uh, is not imaginable with our current view of biology as to how it is uh, that we're going to alleviate the, the uh, catastrophic effects of certain types of mutations that lead to viable, uh, uh, the birth of viable offspring. And uh, now, that's harsh, uh, but I, again, am looking for the right place to re lean in the boat. Uh, I think that more candor on this subject is required. The, the, the length of this gap, of course, it's hard to estimate even in the ideal cases, uh, but it is going to vary uh, from a lot shorter than we think, perhaps a few years, uh, in which we discover that an existing FDA-approved drug uh, actually has uh, some way-off label uh, use, maybe in combination with some other uh, intervention. Uh, to uh, affect uh, major disease processes uh, to, uh, f to, to potentially uh, forever. The uh, human condition is not going to be uh, ultimately, the tragedy of aspects of the human condition is simply not ultimately going to be attenuated by genomics or anything else. So uh, that's a hard problem. The, I mean, Jeff, uh, Jeff, Jeff Duick uh, s said a uh, fairly standard estimate uh, is that it's about 12 years uh, from having a kind of a lead, uh, a lead compound or at least a sort of a serious, uh, a serious plan of attack in developing a pharmaceutical and bringing a uh, drug to market, and that's in the presence of adequate and huge amounts of capital. 
uh, so that's that's a long time. And uh, to the extent that we're going to be looking, you know, for examples of, of, of uh, mainstream drugs uh, that are really affecting uh, human health in a broad uh, way, uh, based on the genome, the human genome sequence, we we would uh, expect that it's uh, going to be approaching 2020 before we uh, have such examples, even in those cases that go extremely well. Back. Uh, Artie Rye from uh, Penn Law School. Um, as some, someone who's a complete outsider to all of this, one thought that I had when I saw uh, the dumbbell slide and also more generally over the, la over the last couple of days is that um, one of the things, I don't know whether this is appropriately categorized in the LC group or if there's another place for it, but it seems to me that there's a lot of institutional input that um, should be gotten um, from economists and biopharmaceutical or pharmaceutical executives, I mean, they talk all the time about these drug development issues. I mean, that's, they're obsessed with this, and for better or for worse. And <coughs> economists are obsessed with these questions. And so the pipeline question and how to make the pipeline wider is fundamentally one that does involve some of the traditional ethical and legal and social questions, but is really also much more fundamentally a regulatory economic question that a lot of people who spend a lot of time thinking about drug economics have a lot of knowledge on. Right, and I'm, this is exactly the type of thing I envision in trying to expand the LC program and make it more integral to everything we do, because uh, those are, to me, are uh, critical LC issues, and uh, we should get engaged with them and uh, broaden the uh, community and uh, put the resources in that it takes to, uh, to do that well. We need, what we can bring to the table, I think, is not so much a lot of uh, policy activity and so forth, is uh, serious scholarship on these issues. I and mean, I, I've gotten into a few of these fights. Uh, I like fights, and, uh, and, and sometimes I'm just appalled at the, you know, the lack of really solid information. Uh, just because these big pharma guys get together and talk about these things all the time it doesn't mean that they're doing it on the basis of any solid information. And, uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's, you're absolutely right. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. They, they, you're right. There's a lot of stuff that's not done on the basis of solid information, but they, too, uh, try to catalyze universities to do engage in this new research. So there is a bit of a back and forth. Oh, but there's a lot of back and forth, but I, I'd, I'd like to see this, this process is extremely important for our society, and I'd like to see this process uh, studied with uh, serious scholarship and, uh, and debated in open uh, forums. And, and I'm not just looking for help in some of the arguments that I like to make. I mean, at the midst of, let's say, the Solera Wars, uh, I, I would have been uh, delighted uh, to have a well-informed scholar out there uh, explaining uh, the case for privatization, uh, because a, a rational argument, even one the, that's the complete antithesis of my views, uh, would have been a lot easier to deal with than what we were up against. <laughs> All right, we're going to do two more. We're gonna do Kurt and then David. I just want to say, that those, who, those of us who interact with uh, patients who have uh, currently untreatable genetic diseases uh, appreciate the uh, importance of hope. and. Uh, uh, you know, well, it's clearly it's, it, on this slide. It's it, it's clearly hazardous to overdose uh, people with hope. It's also important not to deprive them of it. And uh, there's a maybe a narrow therapeutic window yeah. there. I think you I think you have to give people the right amount of hope without overdoing yeah. it. No, the point's very well taken. Uh, Maynard, I too really enjoyed your talk, and I appreciate the emphasis on treatment of genetic disease. And I would just like to point out to people in the audience that there is a metric. Uh, one of the problems with evaluating treatment of genetic disease is that the literature is largely anecdotal. That is to say, a particular investigator reports on their success with one particular genetic disease over a rather, often over a rather short period of time. And so you don't hear so much about those diseases which people have tried and, and there is no, that, that doesn't get into the equation. So I would just point out that there is a metric out there that people can use, and that was a, a set of studies done by Charles Scriver and Barton Childs, which uh, were done first in the early 80s with one set of, with a large collection of diseases, uh, all Mendelian, uh, selected at random, 
and then a subset of those selected with a, a known defect. And then uh, that large collection of diseases looked at in, in the literature in terms of what was the outcome of therapy on a variety of different parameters of quality of life. The same set of diseases were then looked at again in the mid-90s. Interestingly, the fraction which had no response at all to treatment was absolutely constant over that interval, and there was a small decrement in the fraction of diseases, or there was a small increment in the fraction of diseases which had partial response. And uh, they looked again in 97, and it hadn't changed much. But I think it will be fascinating to look at that well-studied set of diseases and ask what's going to happen over the next decade, and I would say with the genome sequence available and with the advances in uh, particularly, I think, mouse models where pathology can be studied in whole animal and the advances in sort of non-invasive measuring of uh, uh, pathophysiology in patients, that there is some hope for uh, an improvement in the slope of this uh, line. Yeah, the only comment I'll make there, I'm I, uh, certainly absolutely consistent with, uh, with where I think we should go. Uh, the one thing I had intended to emphasize a little more strongly than I did, um, I'm just reminded of by your question, uh, is that I, I do think that there is a, a kind of special responsibility of the genomics community to engage itself in the better treatment of genetic diseases. Uh, simply because of the nature of what we do scientifically and the causality of those diseases. Uh, but I also think that, the, uh, that genetic diseases will not always be uh, the best, uh, pr provide the best opportunity uh, for carrying out this mission of improving health generally, and that I would predict that in 2020 we'll be starting to see uh, a big impact of genomic-based methods on really mainstream medicine, you know, where much in the sort of the, the um, LDL receptor story that was uh, alluded to in a couple of talks, uh, you know, where study of rare genetic diseases uh, is informative about how to, to treat the general population. Okay. Well, once again, thank you, Maynard. You make the organizers look good.